Last week we began our orientation on Hermetic philosophy, and as the subject indicates, we must continue this orientation this evening. While it may seem that our development will be essentially historical, this is not the full intent of our present approach. Actually, history in this case is rich with overtones and implications of dynamic philosophical importance. We are not interested merely in digging into the past for the sake of unearthing the intellectual artifacts of our ancestors. We are, however, mindful of the living content of things, which is timeless and has continuing vitality for us. I had a letter through the mail today, a very highly confused person. This person would not have been confused had they possessed any adequate integration around the essential substance of the beliefs with which they were concerned. The living person today, in the search for his own believing, finds it very important to defend values and to protect himself against the superficial attitudes and false interpretations which are so common in relation to great systems of religion and philosophy. We have to have a certain amount of factual background. Lacking in this, we are unable to orient and integrate or to keep our minds clear in our present thinking. So if we sharpen our thinking a little, it will do us no harm in our daily living, where we have been inclined <coughs> to save the mental instrument, protect it from labor, and come too quickly into easy believing, in which there is never any really adequate reward. We have taken this evening three parallel systems for consideration. The Hermetic philosophy, the Gnostic philosophy, and the Neoplatonic philosophy. Now it's more than a coincidence that these should all have flourished in Alexandria in the opening years of the Christian era. It is also not a coincidence that all of these were closely involved in the rise of Christianity. Nor is it by any means accidental that in a strange way, as St. Augustine points out, these three sects were in large measure responsible for Christianity. Now this does not mean he did not certainly intend to imply that Christianity had merely copied these doctrines. Rather that Christianity, confronted by three schools of the magnitude of these, was forced to make very definite plans of its own. It was forced to overcome at an early date as many of the divisions within its own structure as possible. It required a united front against a world that was not ignorant, not stupid, and not gullible. It therefore was a challenge, and it was this tremendous challenge that to a large measure resulted in the final Council of Nicaea and the Christianizing of the Western Roman Empire. It had not, if it not been for these sects, it is very likely that Christianity might have dissolved in its own internal discords. But confronted by these large enemies, it gathered its resources, defined its position ever more clearly, and finally came to a condition of ascendancy. Thus they formed the adversary which sharpened the wits of the early Christian fathers and caused them to give much more scholarly attention to their own doctrines than might have been their original inclination. So we have these three schools and the order of them we should also consider. Uh, for antiquity, the Hermetic philosophy was probably slightly the elder. In other words, it probably arose slightly earlier than Christianity. 100, 200 years, possibly 300. 
It also extended downward through the Christian era and down to the 4th or 5th centuries A.D. The second uh, in historical descent was Gnosticism, uh, which belongs to the first Christian century primarily. It arose probably not later than A.D. 30 and continued to exercise a considerable influence down to also to the 5th century A.D. The third of this group was Neoplatonism, which probably arose in the latter part of the second and probably somewhat in the early part of the third century AD and continued to exercise considerable influence until the fifth century. Thus these three organizations uh, coexisted with the early Christian development. And by the nature of their teachings, this coexistence was again more than coincidental. For when we study these three systems, we observe marked parallels among themselves and to Christianity. The question as to who borrowed from who has always been a moot one, and we will not even attempt to explain and interpret it. We can only say that these persons lived together, that they lived in speaking distance of each other, and that they were united by a common tongue. We know, for example, that St. Augustine was highly conversant with Neoplatonism and apparently did not hold it in essential disregard, although he publicly criticized it on some occasions. Actually, a large part of his own philosophy was certainly influenced by Neoplatonic thought. Trying to analyze the structure of these three uh, uh, non-Christian groups to determine their essential keynote what was the essential difference between them? The more you read about them, the less difference you observe. Until a number of writers have practically given up in despair any effort to distinguish their essential doctrines. These doctrines are so close uh, that they are regarded almost as identical. Actually, they are not identical because each presents a particular perspective about something uh, in which they all have a common interest. The principal foundation of the Hermetic arts must be regarded as scientific. Hermetism, or Hermetic philosophy, was a science. And as it developed, it developed strongly along scientific lines until in the Middle Ages, Hermetic philosophy became the synonym of chemistry. It was based upon a series of exact procedures. It was mathematical and it made very little use of factors uh, beyond the comprehension of the average person, although it did have certain abstract teachings. These abstract teachings, like Buddhism and Confucianism, were rooted in natural phenomena. They were rooted in familiar things, in common everyday occurrences. In this, the Hermetic school borrowed considerably from the Egyptian. For while the Egyptian had a very deep mysticism, his mysticism was always clothed in the familiar forms of natural phenomena. His uh, afterworld state or after death state, for example, the Elysian fields. Uh, well, this paradise was very similar to the Delta of the Nile. In fact, there was very little difference. Here the celestial blessed did not rest forever, but had their proper cattle and plowed their fields just as they did on earth. The only thing is that the difference between the terrestrial Nile and the celestial Nile was essentially that the celestial Nile never failed, whereas the terrestrial Nile sometimes did not rise appropriately and there could be famines in the land. But the heavenly streams, uh, sustained and protected by the gods, meant forever that there would be prosperity in the, in the blessed world and that everyone would have enough to eat, everyone would enjoy the advantages of good living. Now there's no doubt that the Egyptian priests and philosophers went beyond this point, but it is also an evident part of the daily religion of the people. And Hermetic philosophy has a relation to this. It also went far beyond materialism, but it never went beyond the concept of a universal law it never transcended the idea that divine procedures were mathematical, that cause and effect were 
inevitable that uh, the progress of the human being came through the mastery of certain sciences and that of course the science of sciences was that of life itself therefore hermetic philosophy emphasized life as an exact science a science of human generation and regeneration a science of human perfection and the hermetists believed and affirmed indicates we must continue this orientation this evening while it may seem that our development will be essentially historical this is not the full intent Last week we began our orientation on hermetic philosophy and as the subject of our present approach. Actually, history in this case is rich with overtones and implications of dynamic philosophical importance. We are not interested merely in digging into the past for the sake of of unearthing the intellectual artifacts of our ancestors. We are, however, mindful of the living content of things, which is timeless and has continuing vitality for us. I had a letter through the mail today, a very highly confused person. This person would